I'm like, why would I cake self-striping yarn and do that to myself? Because now all the stripes are mixed up and it's not gonna stripe anymore. <laughs> Just saying it out loud makes me feel so stupid. Hello, 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 and welcome to episode 38 of the Wool Needles Hands Knitting Podcast. My name is Taylor, and this is a podcast primarily about knitting, though we do get up to other fiber-related topics from time to time, such as weaving. I am coming to you from Henderson, Nevada, which is a small suburb outside of Las Vegas, Nevada in the Southwest United States. This is where I am from and where I live with my husband, Brandon, our four-year-old son, Angus, our one-year-old son, Ronan, and our big fat grumpy house cat, Oscar. I am a four years retired elementary school teacher where I taught fourth grade for seven years and I taught gifted and talented education for two years. And then I left that to have my first child and be home with him and started my own hand dyed yarn business, which is now Fiber for the People. Thank you so much for stopping by to check out my little corner of YouTube here. If you are a new viewer and subscriber, thank you so much for checking us out. And if you are a returning viewer and subscriber, thank you as always time and time again for coming back and checking out what I have going on over here at the Wool Needles Hands Fiber Journey channel. If you'd like to get in touch with me, there's lots of ways that you can do that. And what I'm gonna do instead of telling you what they all are, I'm gonna pop them up on the screen right now so you can look right over here and see all of the places where you can contact me online. I have two Instagram accounts, which you can see an email address. There is a PO box for the podcast, which actually isn't up here right now, but you can find that in the about section of the channel. And then all of these things are also linked down below in the description box. I wanna give a quick shout out to my moderators. I have a Pinterest moderator and I have two Ravelry group moderators. That is Steffi and Regina. They are my Ravelry group moderators. Thank you ladies so much. You're doing a fantastic job. Everything that you're doing over there, you're so very welcoming and helpful. I appreciate it so much. And Steffi, thank you so much for keeping that Pinterest page for the podcast loaded and full of really inspirational things that we talk about here on the podcast or that just might seem to be relevant to those of us in the Ravelry group. And the those of us in the community surrounding this podcast. In that vein, there is a Ravelry group for the podcast. You can find that by looking down below in the description box. There is a link directly to the Ravelry group, or of course you can search Wool Needles Hands and Knitting Podcast in the groups tab on Ravelry, and you can find us that way. So definitely don't forget to join over there. Lots of fun things going on, which I will talk about in just a moment. As I mentioned before, I own and operate Fiber for the People, which is a hand-dyed yarn business. You can find that by going over to Instagram to fiber.for.the dot people that's the Instagram account associated with fiber for the people yarn you can also visit fiber for the people online which is where all of the yarn is exclusively sold at fiberforthepeople.com I have shop updates every week to every two weeks depending on my workload at the time like I said I am a full-time stay-at-home mom by day and a part-time stay-at-home mom by evening because my husband is home to help me while I work out in my dye studio so sometimes I might have to push shop updates to every two weeks it really just depends but but definitely head over to the website. You can sign up for the newsletter to stay posted there. There was a shop update last Saturday and my next shop update is going to be a special shop update. Um, not this coming Saturday, but the following Saturday where I will only be featuring a particular color that has been very, very popular. It is called Kick Drum. Um, that shop update will be only with new, um, there will be other things in the store in addition to this, uh, but I will only be adding new listings for the Kick Drum colorway. Definitely check out the um, Instagram feed. Definitely stay posted to the newsletter for all information surrounding Fiber for the People. If you decide to go take a look in the shop, don't forget to use the coupon code WNH. That's gonna give you 10% off your entire purchase. All right, guys, it has been a minute since the last time I published a podcast episode. I appreciate all of your patience. It has been quite a hectic um, last two months for me. So it's really nice to be here with you guys today to sit down and record a podcast episode. I have so much to share with you. This may end up being a two-part I don't know. I guess I'll figure that out in post as I edit this. But yeah, definitely a lot to share. So I want to go ahead and dive right into the podcast. And we are going to start with Cal Update. What's going on in the world of Wool Needles Hands Knit Alongs? <laughs> We have one knit along going on right now. And if you would like to take part in this, it is a year long knit along. We are knitting a different hat each month. Learn all about this over in the Ravelry group. It's a lot of fun. Each month has a different theme for what kind of hat that we're knitting. 
really, really a lot of fun to see all of the different hats that you guys are coming up with, patterns I had never heard about. Um, just really beautiful work that's going on over there. So if you're interested in getting started, you can jump in whenever you want. You don't have to participate in every month. Um, you can participate one month out of the entire knit along and still be entered to win a prize. So it's really flexible up to you completely. So I want to go ahead and really quick, because it's been two months since the last time I uploaded a podcast, I want to talk about the winners for January, February, and share the prize for the March portion of the knit along. The knit along, by the way, is hashtagged as hashtag WNH year of hats Cal 2019. Okay, so for January, the theme for January was to knit a hat of your choice. It didn't matter what the design was. It was completely knitter or crocheter's choice in their hat. And we had lots of beautiful submissions, huge number of submissions for January, which I'm super excited about. I do, however, have a winner for January. So without further ado, here is the winner for January. Luann, who is no me knitter on Ravelry, knit the Roebling hat by Jacqueline Salem. This is it right here. It's absolutely beautiful. Luann, congratulations. You are the winner for January and I have a prize for you. This is a project bag donated to the podcast by Tracy Utley, who has Frankly designs on Etsy. Um, she not only included the project bag, but also some really cute progress keepers as well. So here is the prog, uh, excuse me, the project bag. It is a really cool candy skull um, patterned fabric. I'll get up close here so you can kind of see. Um, yeah, really, really funky. I love the roses and, and the really pretty um, pale pink zipper, super cute as well. The inside is lined nicely with some polka dots. Gotta love polka dots, am I right? Yeah, love it, super cute. In addition to this project bag, you will be receiving a little bundle of progress keepers that are also candy skull. Oh, actually, so we have like kind of a cool Let's see, like gothic. It wants to focus on my face. Of course it does, let's make this complicated. So it's like a gothic cross. You got this camera, you got it, right here. Here, 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 really? Really? And you focus. There we are, and we're in full focus. So we have this cool cross, and then a bunch of these little um, candy type skulls that go with it. I don't know, is that what these are? So adorable though. Lots of these are going to be in a little bag inside the project bag and that is heading off to Luann. Get in touch with me Luann, let me know that you watched the episode and that you are the winner and I will get this out to you as soon as possible. Okay, February was the month to knit hats by lesser known designers, knit or crochet hats by lesser known designers and I think that that's kind of, um. The, I don't know whether they were lesser known or not. It just meant that the project or the design that you were going to work up needed to have 30 or less active projects on Ravelry at the time that you decided to cast on. So that was really um, the only requirement. Um, so yeah, it was it was pretty loose. The winner for February was Chris Jorgensen, who is Wapak Design on Ravelry. Now I may be mispronouncing your last name, Chris. Is it Jorgensen or Jorgensen? I'm never 100% sure with that, but either way, you knit a very beautiful heiress hat by Carmen Beck. Chris is going to be winning a hat pattern of her choice by Andrea at the Knit Picky on Ravelry, as well as on Instagram. Just let me know, get in touch with me, Chris. Let me know that you are the winner. I will get in touch. Well, actually you can go ahead and check out Andrea's shop and choose a hat pattern, I will let Andrea know and the transaction will be sealed. But congratulations, Chris. Thank you for participating. It is a beautiful hat. Oh, and before I forget, there's more to just that prize. So in addition to the hat pattern, Chris, you are also going to be winning a beautiful skein of yarn by Mockingbird Fiber Co., which is also Andrea's hand dyed yarn business. So this is, let me, Drops of Jupiter on Bouncy DK. It's 100% superwash um, DK. So it's from Mockingbird... Uh, Superwash Merino, excuse me, DK weight. This is Mockingbird Fiber Co. And here is the color. Let's go ahead and take the band off and show you this beautiful colorway. Look at that. How beautiful is this russet kind of variegated or excuse me, tone? well, no, it's like a variegated with pale creamy parts. There's some black speckles going on in there. Absolutely gorgeous. So Chris, you are going to be receiving this in addition to a hat pattern of your choice by Andrea, who is the nitpicky on Ravelry. 
great price. And you probably can find a DK weight hat pattern and use this to knit it with, but you know, that's completely up to you. So congratulations. Okay, the winner for March. Now March, um, we are in March right now. The theme for March is to knit a hat with an un unusual construction element, something that makes it not your typical beanie. And there's definitely a lot more information along what that means over in the Ravelry group. But the prize for the month of March is going to be um, kind of special because the person who dyes the yarn that I'm about to share is also somebody that I'm doing a special feature on in this episode of the podcast. And that is Siobhan Booth of Yarn Over Floyd. So the winner for March is going to be winning a skein of hand dyed, naturally dyed using marigolds and solar dyeing skein of yarn by Yarn Over Floyd. So I'm gonna show that to you now, which I'm really excited about because it's such a beautiful shade of yellow. So here it is. And it looks like electric yellow with the lights. Um, it is not, it is definitely a natural, I'm gonna back it up a little bit. Maybe if I hold it over here. I mean, down here by my shirt. Yeah, like this is a little bit more accurate what you're seeing down here. When I start holding it up here, you can see it kind of becomes electrified almost, um, but it's beautiful. So this is dyed using marigolds. Um, Shabon, this is actually how I uh, kind of connected with Shabon was her beautiful marigold colors. And I'll talk a lot more about that in just a little bit, but I just am so inspired by the colors that she's able to produce with marigolds. I think especially too, because it's like I, since I wanna say September, I've had just like a bumper crop of marigolds in my backyard. And so it's exciting and it makes me want to try natural dyeing just for fun. Um, you're gonna be winning that skein of yarn as well as a pattern that is a really cool hat pattern that I actually have casted on. It is, um, I've not made much progress on it, but I'm excited to make more progress on it. It is called the Cogent Hat by Alyssa at Aquamoon Knits. She has so kindly donated a copy of this pattern to the podcast, really cool pattern. Definitely Definitely check it out if you are interested in a new color work hat pattern. However, the March winner will be receiving a free copy of this pattern in addition to a skein of yarn from Yarn Over Floyd. So what I wanna do right now is give you guys a quick look at some of the beautiful designs and knits that are coming out of the FO threads for the Wool Needles Hands Year of Hats Cal 2019. I'm gonna mix in January, February, March all together. I'm not gonna designate which comes from which theme. I'm just gonna show them to you guys so you can get inspired to knit some really beautiful hats. So without further ado, here's a look at some of the things that you guys have completed since January. I want to announce an upcoming knit along and I'm super excited to announce this one because it kind of is um I don't know I mean it's it's certainly going to be relevant especially when April is coming and you'll know why in just a second but I just feel like it's such a cool process um knit along meaning that you're going to participate in this for the process of course the finished product as well but really the process of doing this is a lot of fun i did this my first year podcasting so if you've been with the podcast since the beginning you will know the great unravel so this is where we kind of celebrate earth day which is at the end of april i think it's april 22nd a monday i want to say but we celebrate earth day by repurposing old knitwear in creating something new with yarn that we're able to harvest from old pieces of knitwear that we either thrift or that we pull from our own wardrobe. So it's really a lot of fun. It's a cool make along of course, knitters, crocheters, weavers, any kind of, you know, fiber arts. It's really completely up to you. You're all welcome to participate as always. So I'm really excited to announce that this April we are going to be launching the Wool Needles Hands Great Unravel 2019. It is not a, a month long. It's actually going to go all the way until the the end of July. So we have some really some time to kind of dive into it 
and have a lot of fun with it. So that is coming up in April. But I wanna go ahead and give you just a little bit of information about it um, right now. All it is, is knitting, crocheting, weaving, whatever kind of fiber arts you really wanna get into with this, you have to do the craft with recycled yarn not recycled yarn that came to you in yarn form. The yarn has to come to you in garment form or product form and you have to unravel it to harvest the yarn. That's the biggest uh, kind of thing with this knit along is that you are harvesting yarn from garments that are kind of just languishing in your wardrobe or that are being sold in thrift stores um, that maybe you think that you could create something beautiful out of. So that's kind of a big purpose for this. Now that might seem a little bit daunting. How do you unravel a sweater? How do you unravel a garment? I, I completely get that. It's actually quite simple if you know what to look for. And I also have a tutorial on how to unravel a sweater as well here on the channel. I'll link to that right over here and I'll link to it down below in the description box. So all of that is there for you guys. You'll know exactly what the knit along entails, how to unravel a sweater and harvest the fiber, and then the rest is completely up to you and your own creativity. Now you're definitely allowed to double dip for this knit along. So if you would like to take your month of April year of hats project and use the recycled yarn to knit your hat, totally fine. I know the month of April's theme is to knit or crochet a scrappy hat out of leftovers or mini that's completely fine if you want to uh, substitute out the theme for knitting with recycled yarn. That's totally fine for the month of April. But of course, this knit along goes all the way until the end of July. So you can knit more than one item and the more things you knit, the merrier and you could submit as many finished objects as you want into the FO thread. But definitely don't forget to participate in the chatter thread. Now, when it comes to how you participate in the chatter thread, here's the quick and dirty of what I will be expecting as uh, qualifications for participating in the knit along when it comes to the chatter thread. You need to take a photo of the garment that you are going to be using to harvest the yarn. You need to take a photo of kind of the work in progress of harvesting the yarn. So maybe a shot of the sweater being unraveled. You also need to take a photo of the yarn once it's harvested, whether it's skeined up or caked up, show us what the yarn looks like after you've harvested all of it. And then also of course your progress photos on the project that you're working on. So I know it's kind of a lot to ask for, but that's a big part of this knit along is the process in it um, or the process surrounding it. So I really want you to share that process with us on the chatter thread for the Great Unravel 2019. And I really think that's what's going to make it a lot of fun. If you are also sharing these photos on Instagram, don't forget to use the hashtag, hashtag WNH Great Unravel 2019. So when I did this two years ago, I had a lot of fun with it. I actually unraveled several different um, sweaters until I found the yarn that I really wanted to work with. And then I saved the yarn from the others for something to make later. And it's actually going to hook you. So you might find that this is something that you want to do more often, um, but it's a lot of fun. So what I decided to do is I, um, I knew I wanted to create something functional with the yarn that I was harvesting. And so that ended up being a market bag. So this is the Eileen bag. Um, and it's a really great, uh, idea for, you know, this particular knit along. Cause it's, you know, you're not so particular about the yarn when you're making a market bag. You know, you're you, you're open to other kinds of yarns. You're open to things that maybe aren't so aesthetically pleasing because you know it's gonna be a market bag and it's gonna look cool no matter what yarn you choose. I think that's kind of why I went with this. I ended up finding, I got lucky because it's a cool color and it's cotton. And I wanted, uh, if I was gonna make a market bag, I thought it would be best if it were cotton, but it doesn't have to be. It's completely up to you. So that was what I did for the Great Unravel 2017. Um, and I love it. I use this thing all the time and it looks kind of squat right now, but I'm telling you this stretches, it's washable. It's fantastic. So the Eileen bag is an option. I actually have another Eileen bag on the needles right now. Um, so that I have a bit, I wanted it to be bigger and, um, that's for the purpose of taking to the Flagstaff sheep and wool festival, which I'll talk all about that later. That was what I did for the great unravel 2017 just an idea of something that you can do for your great unravel. But like I said, it is completely up to you. So get excited about that. It kicks off in April. You can learn all about it over on the Ravelry group page. But yeah, and that is actually it, you guys, for knit alongs. Right, all right, all right. So we made it past the introduction section of the podcast. So I really kind of wanted to work on making that a little bit more streamlined. Uh, I hope it was, I don't know, I guess we shall see. But I definitely do want to streamline that because 
previously, it, you know, it gets really lengthy when you feel like you need to explain all of that information every time. And so I'm gonna try and avoid doing that because it takes a lot of energy to do that. And there's a lot of that information that I can simply put down in the description box below for you guys to read there. Um, so yeah, that's kind of why I went through that a little bit faster this time. But I want to go ahead and take a minute now to let you know if you are enjoying what you're watching so far, regardless of the fact that I haven't actually started showing you knitting yet, don't forget to hit the like button, give me a thumbs up, and also click subscribe and the little bell icon next to the subscription button so that you can be notified anytime I upload something new to the channel and you can get here early to watch the podcast as soon as it's released. So just a quick reminder to let you know that that's what you can do to become an official bona fide member of the community. All right, guys, I am drinking, uh, I don't know exactly what kind it is but it's one of the celestial seasonings zinger teas it's kind of a nice summer i mean it's it's warm but it's a tangy citrusy summery type tea and i love it it's super refreshing that's what's going on in my cup right now gosh it feels so good to be here with you guys chatting about all of this stuff i don't know if you can tell there is just a boatload of stuff behind me um projects to the left of me projects to the right of me they're everywhere and i have a lot to share with you guys um and it just feels good to be back i it's been a crazy little while since i've seen you last now last time um i podcasted i was explaining to you that uh, i dyed a colorway for the shop and it kind of went nuts um like crazy nuts and it drove a ton of um attention to the Instagram account, my business, to my website, um, to my sweater quantity orders inbox. And so it tied up a lot of my time for the last couple of months and I'm grateful, excited. It's really cool to see where the business is going now. Um, not even just because of that, but for various different reasons. So it's, it's been an adjustment um, when something kind of causes your business to just take a leap like that um, in, in business and you notice this huge surge, you kind of have to adjust to the volume really quickly. And there's a lot of growing pains that go along with that um, when it's so fast. And so I've kind of been dealing with that. And, and I don't want to say dealing, I feel like that has a negative connotation, but I've been going through that um, these last couple of weeks, my husband and I, you know, figuring out how to do things, how to streamline things, um, how to you know, the supply and demand, all of that, which um, when it comes to supply and demand, that's, that's an, when it comes to being a small business, that's one of those things that you have to just kind of accept at a certain level um, because you're only one person, you can only do so many things. And like I've mentioned, I am a uh, stay at home mom in the daytime when my husband is working. And so there's lots of that on my plate. Um, yeah, so, but, you know, regardless of the fact that I haven't podcasted in a while, I have been busy creatively, not only in dyeing yarn, but also in my own crafts. And I'm excited for that. I picked up a new craft, which I'm excited to share with you guys. Just, I don't know, lots of good things. So anyway, here I am. I am back and I have lots, like I said, to share. And now it is March. I can't even believe it. It's crazy. My youngest turns one on the 25th and my oldest turned four, uh, beginning of February. So I don't know, lots going on since the last time we spoke, but uh, but here we are. So I have a big show for you guys. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, guys, it's been a long time since I've done an inner community segment, and I'm really excited for this one because I'm featuring today a really special and inspiring uh, dyer who is Shabon Booth of Yarn Over Floyd. So she's in Floyd, Virginia, and she is a natural yarn dyer. I became really inspired by what she was doing with natural dyes back in early fall when I started kind of catching wind of her work and I loved what she was doing specifically with marigolds and I think that's because back in early fall late summer I started planting marigolds and then they took off I had kind of a bumper crop of marigolds almost all the way through the winter but the bitter end of our winter was very cold so I did uh, have them thin out a little bit but I was fortunate because I harvested lots of those marigolds put them in a ziploc put them in the freezer and they are still in pristine condition in the freezer I'm super excited to try my hand at naturally dying with them, but that's kind of where I got that inspiration was from Shabon's Instagram feed where she shares the yarn that she naturally dyes and sells at yarnoverfloyd.com. I let her know how inspired I was by her colors and what she's doing and asked if I could feature her on the channel to share kind of what she's got going on over there and the beautiful colors that you can get from natural dyes. So when I'm dyeing yarn and coming up with these really pretty saturated colors, 
that's all from acid dye, um, manufactured dye, and it's beautiful and I love it. But when I see beautiful colors coming together from dyes that are naturally derived, it's really cool for me because it's just such a, I feel like, a labor of love to create such beautiful colors from things that aren't so automatically pigmented. You really have to kind of work at it a little bit. I think marigolds um, are probably a little bit more, I don't know, maybe a little bit easier to dye with and get color, but I may be way wrong, so I don't know. That's kind of why I was interested in trying that was because I knew it wouldn't be something like, you know, avocado pits that I would have to get a ton of avocado pits, whatever. I was just inspired by what she had going on over there and I really wanted to feature her on the podcast. So I asked her if she could put some things together that I could share here and she did and it's beautiful. And so I wanna share that with you guys. So I'm gonna go ahead and give the floor to Shabon and introduce you guys to Yarn Over Floyd. Mm -hmm. over Floyd. I'm a natural yarn dyer from a little town called Floyd in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. I live here with my husband and my two daughters on his family farm. We work, raise cattle, have a few goats, and grow a very large garden every year. I've been crocheting for about seven years and got into dyeing a little over two years ago. I started out using extracts from a monthly subscription that Mackenzie at Bee Queen Collection used to send out. After that, I started researching more and more about natural dyeing and what around our farm I could use to dye on my own. I just love color, and the brighter, the more bold, the more beautiful, so making my own color was just something I couldn't resist. And I started with pokeberry and turmeric and purple cabbage. At the time I started looking, we had a bumper crop of cabbages, and pokeberry weed came into season not long after that. Pokeberry is a wild invasive bush that grows bunches of purple berries that almost look like little grapes. The birds love them, and they're incredibly juicy with a beautiful fuchsia stain. Purple cabbage is a lot of fun to dye with because it really is easy to color shift with vinegar and baking soda. Vinegar brings the purple to a dark, rich color, and baking soda turns it to a green, turquoisey color. Turmeric is used quite a bit in Hispanic cooking and in medicinal work. It gives a gorgeous gold color, and all three of these are fugitive dyes that fade to lighter colors quickly, but are a lot of fun to start out with. If mortated correctly, though, they can keep for a long while but are subject to light fading and bright sun and harsh washing. As I continued my research and started playing around through the growing seasons, I moved into things like rose petals and beets and marigolds, which grow like crazy in our garden, uh, Rose of Sharon blooms that we have growing in the yard, planted by my husband's grandmother years ago in all the holes from the old fence row. Uh, one of my aunts grows dahlias, and she gifted me an incredibly prolific yellow-orange plant that I almost got tired of looking at since it grows larger and larger every year. Well, it turns out it makes a beautiful shade of orange and yellows depending on the way you dye with it in solar and on the stovetop. Uh, this summer, I had a lot of fun with plants and flowers and solar dyes. A dear friend of mine at the local yarn shop brought me the dried rose petals from her um, husband that he had given her over the years. It made a beautiful brown color, and you can see on the shawl that she knitted with the yarn, uh, the variegated yarn was a mix of coleus, zinnias, and celosia from her garden. Another reason I fell into natural dyeing was my interest in medicinal herbs and plants. Using teas and tinctures as medicine has interested me so that I can provide her healthier solutions for myself and my family. Indigo and woad leaves were once used for wounds. It's believed that the heat and salt from the skin and sweat helped hold out the pigment of the leaves uh, when applied to the skin, which is what led to it being used as a dye. Mullen is a North American weed that has soft, velvety leaves and often used for herbalists uh, for teas and salves. I process and preserve a lot of plants and produce we grow in our garden. For my process, I start with good, clean fiber. Yarn and fiber are prepared 
before dying in a process called mordanting. Since some mordants, such as copper and iron, were once used as dyes, it is likely that's how our ancestors came to realize it helped other colors stick to the fiber better. Ancient Egyptians used mineral salts to wash their clothes, and I typically use aluminum sulfate to mordant because it produces a clearer, brighter set of colors, since it does not tint the yarn like iron and copper do. I have used iron more for a color shifter for mullein or matter, uh, mullein to make a dark green silvery gray, and matter to make a maroon plum. Around my farm, I grow marigolds, cabbages, walnuts, chestnuts, dahlias, rosa sharon, hibiscus, mullein, blackberry, rhubarb, and staghorn sumac. I hit up our local Mex Mexican restaurant for avocado skins and pits on the regular. I'm the yarn girl down there. And they give me a big bag of um, pits and skins I clean and simmer and use for both a beautiful rose color and a creamy green if given the right conditions. Since my eldest daughter could sustain life on beans and rice if given the chance, I've come to soak the black beans overnight and use the water I pour off to produce a beautiful blue that ages nicely to a bluish gray. I cook dinner right alongside my yarn often enough, which is how I'm able to swing the working mother natural dye or side hustle split so well. I enjoy cooking, so following recipes and making a dye are very similar and work well together. Another form of dyeing I really enjoy doing in the summertime is solar dyeing. It could be the easiest way, and certainly the prettiest. I take pre-mordanted yarns and layer them in a half gallon mason jar with flower heads, petals, and leaves. I do cheat by pouring some hot water over and letting the jar seal, but the hot summer sun is often enough to help the pigment process. I leave it out on the fence post for about 24 hours and get some of the most vivid, variegated, and tonal colors. This is a jar I prepared this past August that made with marigolds. I kept it for our window at the yarn shop and to accompany me on trunk shows. As you can see, it has held its color really well and, main, and remains sealed. I keep a lot of my dyes processed in can jars, as you can see behind me, and to use over the winter time. I gather petals and flowers for storage in the freezer too. A few resources I'd encourage you to look into if you're interested in natural dyeing are Jenny Dean's Wild Color, botanicalcolor.com. Uh, their blog is an amazing source of information. Um, Floyd, Virginia is a sweet little single stoplight town which is visited by tourists every year um, for our bluegrass Friday night jamboree at the Floyd Country Store and extremely talented potters, painters, and farmers. It's definitely worth a visit if you're on the East Coast and you'll be able to find my yarn at our local yarn shop, Wooly Jumpers, where I spend time on the weekends and on my website at yarnoverfloyd.com. I keep a stock of seasonal dyes and can do custom dye lots if you're interested in a larger project. Thanks so much for having me on the Wool Needles Hands podcast. I've really enjoyed it. All right, so let's get into it, shall we? I have lots of whips. I I like to think that what I'm going through right now is kind of like a whiplash because I have no qualms about casting on anything right now. And that's kind of going a little bit against the grain when it comes to the way I was talking and, and uh, you know, kind of going on and on in my last few episodes about sticking to what I have and sticking to my cue and not casting on anything until something is complete. And that was a really big thing, you know, that I was into back then. Um, but I'm kind of not feeling that right now. And I don't know if it's just because of having a really busy, you know, period of time where I just am throwing caution to the wind and going with my inspiration and casting onto whatever, who knows, but I really, I'm completely off the wagon and I'm okay with it. Um, yeah, casting onto whatever I want willy nilly. Uh, and it's not, it's not too bad, but it's, you know, you kind of have to pay attention to it, but I'm happy. I think you'll be happy with what I have going on and I am actively working on these things. So, I mean, I guess that's a bonus. I want to start my whips by talking to you about socks. I have a few pairs of socks here I want to share with you guys. So we're going to do socks first and then we'll move on to uh, all the other things that aren't socks after that. Okay. So the first pair of socks, well, sock, uh, it's not a pair yet, but it's going to be one soon because I'll tell you what, this 
is a magic sock. It knits itself, ladies and gentlemen. Have you heard of these? Yep, they are. Um, you buy this special yarn and the sock virtually knits itself. It's no trouble at all. So that is what I have here is my magic self knitting sock. And it is in stripy sock yarn, you guys. I am telling you, stripy socks, like I said, pretty much knit themselves. There is something about um, the stripes and the changes, and you've heard this before. I mean, okay, camera, there you go. You've heard it all before, how awesome and, you know, tantalizing and diverting uh, stripy socks are, and it is all true, folks. These socks just are flying off my needles. I love them so much. So this is a basic vanilla sock, 64 stitches. I did, um, you know, a knit two purl two rib and I only did, I want to say two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 rows of the knit two purl two. I just went until I didn't want to do any ribs anymore. And then I started knitting the sock. I figured there's enough ribbing here to hold the sock on my leg. I'm not too worried about it. And to be quite honest, I kind of like a, a shallower um, rib cuff, I guess. I feel like it looks cute and I'm, I don't mind it. Um, yeah, so I, and also too, just so you know, I apologize if it takes a second to focus on this. Um, it's going to want to focus on my face. So if you have to wait for like a few seconds for it to focus on my knit project, then I apologize, but there's nothing I can do about that. That's just technology. I am knitting a fish lips kiss heel for this because, and I don't know, I don't, I didn't look up a pattern for a fish lips kiss heel. I just did a short row heel. Is that the same thing? I don't know. I hear people say fish lips kiss heel all the time. And typically I'm a heel flapping gusset gal, but I figured a fish lips kiss heel is a short row heel. Um, I don't know. They're not the most appealing to look at on the sock just because they're kind of weird looking. But let me just tell you the reason why I decided to just go with the fish lips kiss is because all winter, the one pair of socks I wanted to wear all the time was a pair of self-striping socks that I knit two years ago by Rock and String Creations yarn. Um, it was a vanilla sock pattern, but I knit it with a fish lips kiss heel and I love the way it fits. I have been on the heel flapping gusset train for the longest time saying that that's my preferred heel, you know, method. But I really think that I might be changing my mind because not only does this fit really nicely, it kind of hugs your uh, heel nicely. It's a lot easier because you don't ever have to um, kind of, well, especially if you're doing a magic loop, you don't have to put anything onto a holder uh, and you don't have to pick up stitches. You don't have to do some kind of a weird gusset. It's just short rows back and forth. You short rows going in and short rows going back out again and it creates this perfect little uh, pocket for your heel. And I love it. Super, super simple. Um, yeah. So I kind of think that's going to be my go-to heel method now, just because whether it's easier or not, technically it just felt better to me. I kind of just felt like I could keep going without having to kind of stop. And you know, your momentum slows down a lot when you do a heel flap and gusset, I feel, uh, cause you, you know, you get this little flap that goes and then the gusset and all of that. You just, everything slows down a little bit with that. With this, I don't feel like that's the case. Um, the only thing about this that I need to remedy after the sock is finished and I'm totally okay with it is the little hole that you see in the corner right here where the, kind of like the, the heel and the foot or the heel, yeah, the heel and the foot of the sock come together. I don't know if you can see that there's a hole right there. There's a hole on the other side as well. It's not quite as big, but I'm not worried about that just because um, the there's a method that you can use. Actually, Very Pink Knits has a short, sweet, very clear and concise um, tutorial video on how to close that up and have it be pretty much invisible. So I just know that that's what I'm gonna do when I'm done with this and I'm totally okay with it. Um, but yeah, so that is my first sock that I have going on right now. This is Nomadic Yarns. This is the Honey Bear colorway. Her stripes are gorgeous. The colors in this, um, I do have the gobstopper, another you know term that are, is used to refer to the ball of yarn because it looks like the gobstopper candy um, from like childhood. So that's it right there. Just look at these colors. They're gorgeous. That blushing pink, that pretty tobacco gold teal and deep plum purple. 
it just, I love it. So this is um, Ashley Aguilar. She is the dyer behind Nomadic Yarns. Just beautiful work. Love the yarn as well. It's a 7525. Um, but yeah, I started these two days ago and they're knitting them themselves. It's incredible. So that is my first sock that I wanted to share with you guys. And I have more. I'm not done. Let me just go ahead and put this back in the box and pull out the next sock. The next sock that I want to share with you is knit in the um, much loved kick drum colorway by Fiber for the People, which is my hand dyed yarn business. Um, this is kind of a pattern I'm improvising as I go. I wanted to come up with a pattern that I could offer in the shop that you could utilize a sock set for that was color work. So instead of doing, you know, the contrasting heel, cuff, uh, and toe, you could use that contrasting color for a color work pattern on the sock. Now, this isn't my original idea. I actually got the idea to do some kind of a color work pattern with a sock set from Fairlight Fibers, which is an online yarn retailer. They have a pattern that they sell called Golden Gardens, and it utilizes a sock set in the most beautiful color work design. And it's more than just color work. There's some texture going on in the sock as well. I'll pop a picture over here so you can see it really beautiful but I thought it would be kind of cool to offer a pattern similar um, concept wise that you could use a fiber for the people sock set to knit now I have a sock set I do a semi-regular sock set club for fiber for the people and it would be kind of cool to include the pattern in the club you know ideas are circulating in my mind. Anyway, I'm kind of improvising the pattern as I go. I already know some things that I want to tweak in the pattern um, that I'll actually be doing on the second sock. These are going to be for my husband and he's totally okay with the color work design being different on the individual socks. Bless his heart. That's very sweet. Um, but anyway, here it is. Without further ado, this is what I have going on so far and it's super punchy. Look at that. Wow. Um, this is, like I said, the kick drum colorway. And then the contrasting color I'm using here is a mini from Fiber for the People that I had uh, as a lucky strike a long time ago. So I've had this in my stash. The mini or the contrasting color is a 7525. And then the kick drum, which is this main color, is an 8022 ply. They pair beautifully together. And I love the colors together, especially. I feel like kick drum, and let me grab the cake for you and you can kind of get an idea. I'll pop a picture here so you can see it all skeined up. Um, this is kick drum. This is what it looks like in the skein. And then of course this cake is not perfectly wrapped because I've been using it. Um, but this is what it looks like in the cake. It's really, really beautiful. When you freshly cake it, it actually looks almost like an argyle pattern around. It's really pretty. So this is kick drum. And then the this is it knitted up here. It's really such a beautiful deep navy blue. And with that lime apple, you know, Granny Smith apple green, oh, so beautiful. You could use almost any like punchy, vibrant color with this and it would be gorgeous. But yeah, so this is the motif that I have. Now, the reason why I'm going to make some adjustments and, and this is kind of what happens to me as I start improvising color work patterns is that the multiples, I mean, they all are, you know, multiples of, in this particular case, three or six, um, but some of them are also multiples, but we have larger multiples happening down here. I don't really know how to explain what I'm trying to explain. All I can tell you is that things don't line up. Things aren't centered. So when you're looking at these little like zigzags or um, kind of wormy things happening right here, this is not centered over the center of this. And this right here is not centered over this. So it's just not centered. And that's just because I was improvising as I go. I already have a plan for adjusting this portion of the motif to align with this because I really like this. I'm okay with kind of changing this up a little bit. And then this stripe is going to stay like it is. But otherwise, I love the color. I love the idea of having kind of a color work design for a sock that could go with a sock set using kind of using just the um, amount you need in a mini and probably having some left over. Of course, you could add a contrasting heel cuff and toe with the color work design if you wanted. But yeah, that's kind of what I'm working on here. I don't have a pattern name. I'm not done writing this up. When I am, I will be asking for test knitters. But when that time comes, I'll let you know. Right now, I'm just having a lot of fun working it up. Um, my husband seems to like it. They fit him really well. I am working this on a size two. So I cast it on with a size one. I did the knit two purl two. Um, and I think it's 72 stitches. And then I worked the color work pattern on a size two thinking that I would need it to be a larger needle just in case it tightened up a little bit. 
but it's a little loose and that's why these are for Brandon and not for me. I probably will go down a needle size to tighten things up a little bit in future, but yeah, I'm really happy with them. Super, super fun socks. Love looking at them. Very punchy. But yeah, that is my no name mystery color work sock to be to be named at a later date. Okay, so I have another pair of socks that you've seen. I actually talked about these on the last episode of the podcast and I have made zero progress on them since we talked last and I have a reason for that. Um, now, as is the case with hand dyed yarn in more often with certain colors than others, the skein will kind of change as you knit with it. So you're going to get kind of a variation in color and saturation and all of that. I decided to knit this pair of socks, um, two, not two at a time, but two concurrently. And the way this, the, this particular skein came, came out, I guess. And this is fiber for the people yarn in the jamboree colorway. Um, the two socks look like this one's definitely more saturated than this one. And I'm okay with that generally, but I think what, is making me want to rip these back is because I want to use this yarn combination because I love it so much that gunmetal gray with this really pretty um, red and purple and taupe and all of that. I want to use this to knit the next sample of the pattern that I'm making for Brandon or for the color work sock I just showed you. So these are actually going to be coming off the needles and I'm going to rework them up as samples for that pattern. So these are going bye bye. And then I have a pair of socks that I had started. I actually have one sock completely finished um, a year and a half ago. This is the sock. I've shown this on the podcast. I'm not going to like go get my sock blocker for this just because, you know, it's a sock. It's, it's right there. It's blocked, actually. This is using my Lights Through the Trees color. This was the first iteration of that colorway back when I uh, announced it a year and a half ago. This is just a plain vanilla sock. I'm using a contrasting color for the heels um cuffs and toe well actually just the heel and toe and it's um this was a lucky strike way back when as well on a gold stellina base which i actually currently don't offer in the shop right now so i mean all of this is such a throwback um but anyway i have this one finished and i have the other one so close so it's already here at the um the heel has been turned and i'm decreasing back down for the circumference for the foot. So I'm going to go ahead and just knock these out. This is something I'm going to start actively working on. I've picked it up and done a few rows already, but I'm going to start knocking this out because I do like the sock. The um, color is really pretty and it's just, it will be another pair of hand knit socks for me to have in my collection. So that is one of the socks I'm actively working on as well. Just socks everywhere, socks all the time. But yeah, so that's what I have in the way of socks, but I did with my, you know, whiplash that I'm suffering from. I remembered that I had a ball of self-striping yarn from by Regia. This was actually a gift from a swap that I did with Casey Maura of the Creative Musings podcast. And I love it. I've never knit with Regia yarn before. I hear that it's all the rage, um, a really great sturdy sock yarn and it's self-striping. So I actually just cast it onto this um, today because I couldn't resist. I figured that other one is going to be done so soon. I want to have another one that I can work on while I'm working on that one because I don't have enough to work on. I need more striping socks to knit. So that's all I have so far. It's a sock mustache at this point. It's just purple and pink, but eventually it's going to turn into a sock goatee or is this, is the goatee mean it's the top and the bottom or could a goatee just be the part that's on the chin? Questions. These are important things that we need to address. This is the cake. Oh, funny story here. And you're going to laugh at me. Probably you might not. You might just think this is just silly. Um, this is the beautiful cake. I went to find this in my stash. I knew it was in there and I had recently caked up my entire stash. And if you feel compelled to tell me about how I shouldn't do that because it's going to stretch out all my yarn, just don't worry about it. It's fine. Anyway, I caked this one up and I went and I grabbed it out of my stash, realizing that this was the self-striping yarn. And a moment, there was a moment where I panicked. I'm like, why would I cake self-striping yarn? Because now all the stripes are mixed up and it's not going to stripe anymore. <laughs> Just saying it out loud makes me feel so stupid. Legitimately concerned me. I thought that that was going to happen and I sat down. <laughs> so I don't know. Is that, I'm going to, 
Moving on. So those are my socks. A lot of socks going on and I'm totally okay with it. I'm excited to have them all off the needles. The self-striping socks are so much fun. I don't know why it's taking me this long to cast onto another pair, but I love it. And you guys, all you have to do is go on Etsy and type in self-striping sock yarn and you're going to find beautiful, beautiful yarns from amazing self-stripers. I have a huge respect for these hand dyers that are dyeing self-striping yarn. You guys, I see the operations that you have going on. I see these really, these contraptions that measures out the yarn. I applaud you, I think that's amazing. So definitely check out wherever you can, find some self-striping yarn if you have yet, yet to knit with it because it's a ton of fun. All right guys, before I move on to the next works in progress that I have going on, I wanna let you know that this may end up being the end of part one of this podcast because my husband's taking off to go play softball and I will be here with my littlest and I need to go do some momming and I will be back for part two. We are back, welcome back to what might end up being an actual part two of the Wool Needles Hands Knitting Podcast. I had to go take over while my husband went to play softball, but I am back now and honestly I I checked myself over I've been holding a little one and I might have gotten spaghetti on me somewhere I didn't see anything uh, but you know if you notice something that I'm not noticing I apologize I did eat an entire bowl of spaghetti in like record time um, but I'm back now so welcome back to what might be part two of the podcast who knows it is now dark outside or getting dark so I went ahead and closed the curtains episode 38 after dark but let's go ahead and pick up where we left off with works in progress okay this next work in progress I want to share with you is another um, design that I'm working on and it's you know, it's a color work motif, but it's also kind of a textural idea that I had, and I'm hoping it translates pretty well on camera. I think it's really beautiful. The colors are so spring and pastel and eastery to me, um, but it's a lot of fun. So this is, like I said, it's a color work hat. Now, okay, when it comes to the hats that I'm working on for the Year of Hats Knit Along, I am trying my best to knit from the knit along to try to pull from the themes that are uh, we're, we're working through with the Wool Needles Hands Year of Hats Cal. Um, I'm not doing the best job. I will probably complete a few that are in theme hats, but I, I do my best. I try to go with what inspires me. Okay, so this is a color work design using a worsted weight mohair and wool fiber as the contrasting colors and I'm loving the way it's coming out I don't have a lot of progress to show you because it's taking me some time to work up but here is what I have so far okay um, the base color or the the main color that you're seeing here is kind of an oatmeal color this is lion brand um, fisherman's wool that I had in my stash that I wanted to kind of pull for my sample. I really love this yarn, honestly. I feel like for a budget yarn that's 100% wool, non-superwash, it's really a great option. Super affordable. You get a ton in one, you know, big ball of Lion Brand Fisherman's wool. So it's really great. It actually, so here's um, this is actually this has been used a few times. I've pulled from this a few times, and this is what I have left. It's just a really big hank. Whoops, <laughs> that was obscene. But that's what I have for the main color, and then the contrasting colors that you're seeing here are a worsted weight mohair wool blend, and they're so pretty. I have had these in my stash for the longest time, not knowing what to do with them until finally I decided to try using them as, you know, the contrasting colors for a, a color work pattern. And that's kind of what I've got going on here. These are by um, Katia is the name of the yarn brand. And well, actually, okay, one of them, two of them are Katia. One of them is, oh goodness. Um, classic Elite. So this is Classic Elite. This is a discontinued yarn. They don't make this anymore. It's called Legrand. I have looked everywhere for a sweater's quantity of this online in a color that I like, and I can't find it for the life of me. There's, um, you know, and a sweater's quantity would require more than 10 balls because this is a 50 gram ball. Um, but I can't find anywhere a sweater's quantity in a decent color. I see, um, half a sweater's quantity all the time on eBay in various different colors. Nothing that I would really want to knit up into a sweater, but I can't find this stuff and I love it so much. It's a worsted weight or an Aran weight um, wool and mohair blend and it's so fun to work with and the color is so cool. 
And then these two here are Katya. This is not a discontinued yarn. Um, I do believe they still make this. Um, this is more of a worsted weight, whereas the uh, classically is an Aran weight, but it hasn't really been an issue in the knitting so far. So that, um, these are the contrasting colors. So it is a three color color work pattern, which is another reason why it's taking me some time. I um, kind of, did, I mean, I knew that three colors in a color work pattern, especially when you have all three colors in one row, I knew that would be complicated, but it's, it's definitely very slow because you can't just work from one hand to the other hand or two colors on one finger. You're having to drop colors and pick up new colors frequently. And so it's taking me some time. So this row that I'm actually working on right now is like that. I know, if, you know, when I'm looking at it here on the screen, the contrast is subtle. But I almost think that's what I really love about this is just the subtle contrast because where you're getting a punchy contrast is in the textures of the yarn. So you have kind of a rustic wool yarn here and then this real fuzzy halo happening in that mohair blend. So really, really cool. I don't have a complete pattern for this. I'm kind of, uh, I'm actually working with graph paper as I go to develop. I have what I think is going to be most of the motif already planned out and I'm working from that plan to knit this up. I'm not sure if I'm going to just chop it at that and then close the hat or, you know, decrease for the crown. We'll see as we go. But I have just recently picked this up again after putting it down when things got a little busy because it does take some time and focus to really get going with it. But I really love it. I love the texture. I love the way it feels. There's a lot of yarn involved and thankfully... I have a really great project bag for holding all of this. So I have an FO that I'm gonna share with you later that is a sweater. And this was the project bag that I was working out of the whole time I knit that sweater until the sweater was finished. And it's so spacious, it's amazing. This is by um, Bags by Awesome Granny and it's beautiful. So here it is. It is holding a skein of Lion Brand and then th those three big poofy skeins of the Mohair Blend plus the project. And I have plenty of room left over in this thing. It's huge, it's fantastic. Perfect project bag for a sweater project. It's really, really great. And it has this awesome handle that I love it when you know project bag designers include a handle. I feel like that's really thoughtful. And then it has this cool um, ring here to keep your you know, your progress keepers or, you know, a keychain. I don't know what have you, anything you can put on here um, to store things. I guess you could say interlocking stitch markers, who knows? And then it's got this really cute, and I'm all about the polka dots, um, polka dot lining. Look at that. There's the label bags by awesome granny. I'm just, her bags are really something else I'm telling you. And it's got um, a little bag, a com accoutrement or a small little bag to go with it. A really great place to keep your notions. This is, she sells this in her shop as a set. So this is kind of a sweater bag or a sweater project bag set. So you get the smaller um, bag inside of the bigger bag as a set. And I feel like it's, that's such a really good way to go. I feel like you could, when you have a sweater, you're usually going to be keeping some tools with your sweater, whether it's, you know, a tapestry needle or a cable needle or, you know, all the little nicks and knacks that you want to have with your project. You can keep them in here if you have to change needle sizes, which is the case with my sweater project is I needed two different sizes of needles. So I just kept the uh, other needle that I wasn't working on in here. And I thought that was really convenient with, you know, some stitch markers and probably chapstick and a measuring tape. See, all of the things, the possibilities. But I love this, and it's just super, super convenient and spacious, and even the sweater project I was working on, there was some space left. It wasn't overstuffed. Oh, my mom is here with um, Ronan, my littlest, because my oldest son went with my dad to the softball game, and so that's the dynamic happening right now. So if you hear some crying, I apologize. Um, but that's what's going on right now. Love this bag. Bags by Awesome Granny. Definitely check them out. I do have one of these sets 
coming out for a prize for later in the Wool Needles Hands Year of Hats knit along. And I'm, I'm almost thinking I'm gonna save it as part of the grand prize um, because it's really a fantastic prize. But in the meantime, definitely check her out on Etsy and on Instagram, Bags by Awesome Granny. I mean, you guys, they're really fantastic. Super well-made, love it so much. And that is what is holding my color work hat pattern. Okay, so in my big market basket, I have some other works in progress that are um, on the needles. And so I'm gonna pull them out of here to share them with you. Oh, and I realized I have forgotten a pair of socks that I wanted to share with you. I'm telling you, whiplash, folks. That is what's going on. So I'm gonna set this back down right over here and share with you this other pair of socks that I forgot to share with you earlier that I'm really loving. These are my Honey Bee Dance Socks by Helen Stewart of Curious Handmade. I'm knitting these concurrently, except I have a little bit more progress on one than the other, so I'm just gonna go ahead and show you this. Really pretty pattern. I like the socks. Not a, I don't jump to knit these just because they do require a cable needle and it's a little bit more of an intricate pattern, but I'm okay with that because I like having them there when I want a little bit more of a challenge. I can pull these out and have something uh, a little bit more thought-provoking. That's not the right way to say that, but here they are, the Honey Bee Dance socks, and they're really, really something else. Very beautiful pattern, especially in this lovely yarn. This is stash yarn, this is lichen and lace. Um, I had this yarn from way back when, when I thought that I was gonna knit a Find Your Fade, and that was what, two and a half years ago now, and I never knit a Find Your, actually I did, I knit part of one, but then I ripped it back because I didn't want to knit anymore with it. <laughs> so I had a bunch of this lichen and lace yarn left, so this is, um, that yarn i don't know the color because for whatever you know reason i didn't save the label but i do know it's lichen and lace it is a very lovely yarn beautiful color and i think it shows the design really really well really cute so that is the honeybee dance sock it is uh plain on the back so it's a plain on the back and then this really fun cable pattern on the front but that is my first i have most progress on that and then here is my second. The reason why this owl is hanging from here is because I have on my um, iPad, you can, there's this new app and I wanted to share it with you guys. Excuse me. Um, it is an app, what is it called? What is this even called? It doesn't say, but the little, um, Icon. Oh, Knit Companion. So it's called Knit Companion. There is a free version and there's a paid for version. I have the paid for version because it has a lot more, um, a lot, lot more options of things that you can do to customize it. It gives you a place for the patterns that you're actively working on from Ravelry. So if you um, purchase something on Ravelry and you add it to your library, you can import it into this app and it's there for you. So when you want to start working on a particular pattern, you don't have to download it onto your device. It pulls it from the Ravelry uh, site and it holds it here for you and you can work from it. And there are lots of different, you know, highlighters and markers and whatnot. I don't want to go into great detail about that because it would take me forever. But if you do need a really great place where you can store all of your patterns instead of having paper patterns, or if you just want an easier place to organize all the projects that you're working on, this is a really great, um, you know, idea for how you can do that. I really love it. All of my projects that I'm actively working on are right here. It's just a matter of opening it and starting working on it. My markers stay where they belong. My highlighter marks stay where they belong. It has a little counter so I know which rows. It's just, it's the whole enchilada. So it's called Knit Companion and you can download it for your phone. But the reason why I put, um, or your iPad, the reason why I put the owl on this one is because I have two row counters on my knit companion and one of them I just want to know that this is for a particular row counter and the other one is for the other <laughs> this doesn't even matter but yeah there's a place to take notes on knit companion as well so I have it written the red counter is for the owl marker something like that the way our brains work who knows but those are my Honey Bee Dance socks, and I really love them. If you want something a little bit more intricate to provide you with some challenge, definitely check it out. She has a ton of patterns with 
beautiful textures on the front panel um, that would satisfy that need. These are just the ones I chose and I'm having a lot of fun with them. Okay, next in my big basket, I mentioned earlier in the show the Eileen bag, which is what I knit for the Great Unravel 2017. I really love the bag. I use it all the time. It can hold so much. I took it with me to stitches and I would jam pack it full of yarn. It's a workhorse bag and I really love it. And so I wanted to make another one because I'm gonna be going to the Flagstaff Sheep and Wool Festival. I think that's what it's called. Um, wool and Fiber Fest, but it takes place in Flagstaff, Arizona. It's in June and I really want to go just to go with a family because Flagstaff is a great place for family. It's d not far down the road from the deer farm, which is just kind of like a petting zoo. And then further down is Williams, Arizona, where you can see trains and an old town and it's kind of the gateway to the Grand Canyon. It's a really cool place to go. So we decided we were gonna pack up the family and head off to Flagstaff for that particular fiber festival. Um, and I wanted to have a new Eileen bag to take with me for that purpose. So I decided to cast on to another one using a much bigger yarn because I wanted to create a much bigger Eileen bag. So I was going to recycle something for this and harvest the yarn, um, but I decided I wanted to try uh, a different something I saw at Joann's and they had this really cool super super bulky yarn it almost looks like it's a t-shirt yarn it's just you know a cotton it just looks like t-shirts that have been made into tubes which is essentially what it is and it's a cool like I don't know what you would call this like marbled kind of mid-century modern colors especially paired with this lime green that I'm using as the contrast I think it's by Burnett. I'm not exactly sure, but they have it at Joann's. I thought it would make a really cool Eileen bag, and it definitely is doing that. I'm pairing it with the same yarn in this chartreuse um, lime green color here, and I think that contrast is a lot of fun, but it is definitely knitting up into a really big bag. That's like, I mean, almost the width of my shoulders, but I love it. Instead, because I wanted to like get going with this and I didn't want it to you know, drag on. And I don't know how I thought that it would ever drag on considering how big this yarn is. I decided I wanted to crochet the bottom panel. Whereas in the pattern, it calls for knitting, you know, uh, a big rectangle of fabric as your bottom panel and then creating a knit lip going up the side. The only thing I did differently is I just crocheted my bottom panel because it, I literally was done with the bottom panel in less than five minutes. I just whipped it up and then I picked up the stitches along the bottom panel and knit the lip that goes up the side like normal. And I'm actually really happy that I did that. Aww. The fabric that's created with this, I was a little concerned at first thinking it would be too open and that things would fall out. But as I started working on it, I realized that that's not the case. It really, I mean, it's open and airy like a crochet or a knit bag, or like market bag would be, but it's definitely not so open that things would fall out. I mean, maybe like a pencil or a pen or whatever, but the thing that's nice about it is this bottom portion will hold things nicely and nothing is slipping through, you know, that chartreuse part it's really tightly knit and crocheted and uh, I think that's that's important because that would be probably where things would tend to fall through most but nothing's coming through that it's it's really nice and tightly woven in there but yeah I'm really loving this it's working up really fast I just um, I started it this is probably as much progress as I made in a day um, after I cast it on and it's working up on a size 17 I just you know I improvised that I chose the yarn and I figured a 17 even a 19 would probably work if you are going to knit the Eileen bag with a really chunky yarn like this or a super bulky yarn, err on the side of tight down at the bottom because like I said, you don't want anything to come through down here and that's where you're going to want some of that structure. I debated working it, like flipping it inside out and having this be the bottom because it creates this cool like box effect when you flip it out like this because it has what looks like a kind of a seam or a like a ridge at the bottom but I don't really like the way this fabric looks inside out. So I'm just going with it the way it's supposed to be. And I think it's fine. It'll have a nice little curve to it at the bottom, like a market bag should. But yeah, so that is my Eileen market bag. 
I've seen lots of market bags. I've knit two different ones and I've seen lots of different patterns online for both crochet and knit. And honestly, when it comes to the style that I like, and then of course the functionality from what I've experienced with it, you really can't beat the Eileen bag. It's got a real nice broad strap and it's designed so that the strap is not knit too long so that it can stretch and not become this overly stretched out strap. And then of course the fact that it's so wide. As you can see with this, it has a really nice wide strap on it. So when you stretch it, it doesn't stretch a whole lot. It's nice and sturdy. And I just think that's a really smart um, detail in the bag. And so I really like that about it too. So if you need a market bag that you want to knit, this is a pattern you could go to time and time again and create an Eileen bag collection. But that's what I'm doing with this. And I'm super excited to have it finished because I think it looks really cool and it's going to be very functional for all different kinds of things. Okay, last knitting whip for today. I am not showing my trust card again. I have made some progress on it. Primarily the reason why I'm not showing it is because I forgot it outside. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and save that one for the next episode because even though I've made progress since the last episode of the podcast, I haven't been working on it lately. So we'll save that for the next episode. But I do have another sweater that I have casted on and I'm excited to share it with you guys. This is my first ever Caitlin Hunter pattern. And I'm, I'm excited about it because I love the color work motif and I love the yarn that I'm using. This is the Kovua sweater. Don't know if I'm saying that correctly. Um, who knows? But it's a beautiful, beautiful design by Caitlin Hunter, who is Boyland Knitworks. I'm sure you are familiar with her. If not, um, that's a, a new, well, she's not even really a new designer anymore, but she's super popular. And her designs are, are really interesting and kind of... I don't know, just eclectic. I think that's kind of what I think about when I think of her designs. They're all very eclectic, colorful, kind of a little bit boho. Um, yeah. Anyway, here's the Kovua. This is what I have so far. I'm just working on the yoke. I am knitting this all in Green Mountain Spinnery yarn. It is a woolen spun yarn that spun here in the United States at their mill in Vermont. I wanted a really cool contrast, something a little bit different. And then I also wanted the contrasting color to uh, very similar to the way it does in the original pattern because they're using spin cycle yarns. It's kind of a cool um, fading effect of the contrasting color because the the yarn is created by spinning two different colors of fiber together. So you almost get like a cool variegation happening in the yarn as you knit with it. Um, gradient, I think that's what I'm trying to say, is some kind of a gradient in the contrasting color. Um, I didn't see anything by Spin Cycle that was there that really stuck out to me as being what um, the colors that I wanted, or they didn't have the quantity and the color that I did like but I really liked this particular yarn that they had at Green Mountain Spinnery. The contrasting color I'm using is on their Ragtime 2-ply DK weight, and it is in the Bessie colorway, and it's this really cool, um, it's not a gradient really, as much as I think it's supposed to be kind of a stripe. For what I was looking for, for something that kind of had a gradual color change in the color work, this is definitely serving its purpose. It's really, really beautiful. But the blue, I mean, just look at these blues. How gorgeous are all of those? There's blue, there's gray, teal. I really love it. So this is the contrasting color. And then the main color is there. I want to say it's called Music. I think that's the name of the base, M-E-W-E-S-I-C, like a play on the word U, um, and it's a DK weight base, and it is in the Mean Mr. Mustard colorway. So those are the two that I am using for the sweater, and I feel like the contrast is so cool, so unique. Um, yeah, loving it so far. So here it is, again, worked up, and you can see how pretty, I uh, don't wanna pull my needles out, can see how pretty those two are together and you can also see how the color of that contrasting color is changing so it started out as this really pretty teal or cyan you know blue color and it's working its way into a deeper darker blue as I knit with it and then it'll eventually go back to this color and then back to this color I think it's gonna look really beautiful as I work with the color work and the texture as well because it's not just a color work pattern um, or a color work sweater there's lots of fun texture happening here created with knits and pearls nothing crazy um, and I love that and then of course the woolen spun yarn gives it that kind of nice marled look 
but I'm really, really happy with it. I ended up knitting the um, neckband on a size smaller needle than what uh, I had intended to knit it with because I wanted it to be a little bit more of a funnel and have a little bit more structure. And so that's kind of what's going on here is definitely more of a funnel. So it will kind of sit. I don't know if that's like a good way to show it, but it'll sit here. The one that Caitlin Hunter is wearing in the photo, it almost seems like it stretches down and it's like kind of like a boat neck and I didn't really want that. And a lot of the um, projects that I saw on Ravelry that people had been knitting had kind of this funnel neck and that's great, I like that a lot. So I'm hoping it kind of stays that way after blocking. But I'm really happy with this. A lot of fun, the color work pattern's really intuitive, um, nothing crazy. It's a beautiful feather motif that I think is really interesting and kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of earthy and I like that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really loving this pattern. I had to go back, this is crazy. Um, I actually had to knit back about eight rows or rounds because as I was knitting, and I remember the moment that it happened, but as I was knitting, my marker that denoted the beginning of the round came off and ended up in my lap. Well, when I went to put it back at the beginning of the round, the place where I ended up putting it was not the beginning of the round. It was exactly halfway across or halfway around the the round. And so it was in, in the, so like if this were my beginning of the round over here where my needles are, I had placed the marker all the way over here on the exact opposite side. And then I worked row after row for about eight, eight to 10 rounds, um, thinking that that was the beginning of the round. And the, the, uh, kind of deviation in the pattern was so slight uh, up until a certain point that I just didn't even notice and I didn't pay attention to where my tail was. I don't know how I got that far but it was so frustrating because it became more noticeable at that point. There was like a point where all of a sudden I was like wait this is way wrong. And it was hard for me to figure out exactly what had happened and where it went wrong. And so I just had to keep knitting back until my beginning of the round matched up and what was on the one side was opposite or was not what was on the other side. Really hard to explain, but definitely an annoyance. So I had to take back some of my progress, but I am working at this steadily and it's, you know, coming back to where it was before. So I really enjoy working on it. It is definitely, a, I could watch a TV show and knit on this at the same, except you have to be careful because what I did could end up happening, happening to me. And that might've been why it happened to me. Who knows, but enjoying it. The Kovua by Caitlin Hunter. Um, I can't speak much to her pattern writing or whatever because I haven't made that much progress, but I will definitely let you know as this is my first Caitlin Hunter pattern, but I really don't think that that's gonna be an issue because she's very popular. Everybody likes her patterns. That's, no, I don't know if that's true. I'm sure not everybody likes her patterns, but you get what I'm saying. She's kind of the hot ticket right now. So I will let you know, but that is my Kovua hold that up there. That's my Kovua by Caitlin Hunter. All right, folks, that's the last of my active works in progress. I do have a few other things that are going right now, um, but I haven't made enough progress that I really want to take the time and share those just yet. So those will be coming down the pipe on the next episode of the podcast. But let's go ahead and move on to finished objects. I'm kind of doing this in reverse this episode. Usually I try to do my FOs first, but let's go ahead and do those now because I have a really exciting one that I want to share with you guys. Okay, so I probably could have taken off my yellow top and put on my sweater so you could see it all by itself, but I figured, what the heck, we're just gonna go with it because I have a finished object photo of this sweater that I can show you in just a second. But this is my Felix Pullover by Amy Christophers and I couldn't be happier with this, you guys. I'm probably not gonna have it on for very long because it is very warm and it's warm. It's not, I mean, it's not cold in the house, but I had to show you, I had to put it on and do the whole uh, reveal of it on. But I'm gonna go ahead and take it off now so I can hold it up and show you some things. Okay, quite a relief actually, it's a little warm already. It's mohair and merino and those two things together make for a very warm sweater. Okay, last time we chatted, I hadn't even cast it onto this, nor 
had I even talked about wanting to cast on. I don't believe that I had. Um, I'm not 100% sure. So this is definitely something I casted onto and finished between this episode and the previous episode. I am so in love with this. I've worn it several times so I can actually tell you I really love wearing it. I've worn it, I think since I cast, I think I've worn it probably, I don't know, maybe eight times. Um, a lot. Uh, it definitely um, a lot considering that it hasn't been that cold. So trust me when I tell you I love it so much. So again, this is the Felix Pullover by Amy Christophers. This is knit in Fiber for the People yarn on the Merino Worsted Base and the Kid Silk Mohair Base. Backwards. <laughs> the kid mohair silk base held together and it makes for a really beautifully soft just scrumptious combination yarn and the halo is lovely this is a uh, kind of an a exploratory colorway here um I'm thinking about bringing it to the shop. It's kind of a real pretty pale mauve with a gold undertone. There's little gold undertones happening in there and I'm not sure if you'd be able to see it here, but um, little like kind of shades of gold under that mauve. It's really beautiful. I wore it to stitches and people really loved it. It made me feel really good. It's a fantastic sweater, such a fun knit. If you want something that's all in one piece in the round, that's gonna knit up quickly and just be enjoyable to work on, this is where you need to go because it is, I don't really know what it is because there's a lot of stock in it, but it did never seem boring or, um, I don't know, it, it never was mundane. It was always really enjoyable to work on. And I think that's also to the yarn, um, a nice soft worsted with a mohair uh, paired together. I The drape of this, look at how beautiful that is. It's stunning. I love it so much. I have never been more proud of the worsted weight yarn that I offer in the shop as well as the mohair than I am with this sweater just because it really shows it in all of its glory. It's such a beautiful combination, such a beautiful yarn. Love this. Um, a couple of the things that I really love about this are these real pretty eyelets that go down the raglan. I think that's a really sharp, smart design choice. And then I love the neckline. This neckline, it's not really a boat neck, and then of course it's not a basic crew neck. It sits just right where I want it to sit on my shoulders and my collarbone. It hits in all the right spots. You can wear it with a cute tank top under it, like a white tank top, a gray tank top, or you can wear it without a tank top and it's really, really nice. Or like kind of how I had it, you could figure out a way to pair it with something that has a collar, um, maybe in a better color <laughs> combination, but really, really cool design I, I think and just kind of the shape of the whole thing a couple modifications one intentional the other one not so intentional um the ribbing on the cuffs and the neck calls for a one by one i'm not a fan of one by one you probably have heard me say this if you've been watching the podcast for any length of time i tend to think it looks sloppy and not very structured so i decided to turn it into a one by one twisted rib to give it a little bit more of that structure and rigidity and I think it just looks beautiful. I almost think that in every instance where a one by one is called for from here on out I'm going to be doing a twisted rib just because I think it looks so much neater. Same thing here on the neckline you can see that it's a nice structured solid neckline. It's not flimsy it doesn't have that kind of curl in that curly but um the stitches look nice and neat and straight and I think that's coming from that one by one twisted rib and there's the bottom hem as well just just really nice I think nice and neat now the one modification I made that I didn't mean to make and I just think that maybe I wasn't so it's a the the way that I size this is I did a combination of sizes it's not all one size I did the arms for a particular size, the body for a particular size to get kind of the measurements that I wanted to fit me. Um, and I'm really happy that I did that. But the one thing that I did do that I should have thought about was I made the armholes way too deep. And I say way too deep as if it's a problem. This is not a problem. They are just deeper than what the pattern calls for. So the pattern would have called for the armhole to end probably, don't mean to flip you off, uh, probably right here and mine ends down here. So what happens is, is you get kind of a, 
kind of what looks like a mock dolman sleeve. So when I pull my arms out, there's a little bit of a connection there. And it just looks like a dolman sleeve. It doesn't look unintentional. It doesn't look accidental. And it really doesn't impede with how I wear the sweater. It's still very comfortable and very wearable. And so it didn't bother me. And I didn't notice it really until I had a significant amount of the body finished and I didn't want to go back. It just wasn't a big enough issue to me because it was on both sides. So I felt like, okay, it's consistent. It's, um, uh, what do you, symmetrical. It's, you know, it's fine. I'm just going to leave it because it really, and it's not even one of those things that like it didn't bother me because I didn't want to do the work. Like it genuinely doesn't even bother me now. Um, I don't regret having not gone back. I'm completely happy with it. So that was the only other thing, uh, modification that I made to this that was <laughs> unintentional, but otherwise you guys, I love this. I love it so much. Like I want so many things made with this combination of yarn. Again, that's the fiber for the people merino worsted and the kid mohair and silk. And oh, it's really, it's really beautiful. And as I said, I've worn it so many times and it still looks so pristine and blocked and fantastic. I can't say enough about this sweater. And that is a testament to the design. Um, I really applaud Amy Christopher's for coming up with such a wearable design and I, I appreciate that so much and I don't know I love it as for blocking this I really did not want to block it aggressively not and it was knitting to size it was really knitting perfectly to size but I just didn't want to block it aggressively I liked the way it was fitting and so I decided I was just going to steam block it and it's very simple the way that I do it is really simple actually I'll go ahead and show you here how I do it in just a second but I just used my clothes steamer and um, laid it on a table on top of a fabric you know, that so that it could absorb the moisture and I just steam blocked it and it was super simple and it came out beautifully. So here's a quick look at how I steam blocked my Felix pullover. It came out looking fantastic, just ugh, so lovely. I can't show it all in the, in the frame right now, but it's it's something else. It's really beautiful. You can see it right here um, in all of my mom jean glory. I had to have my son take this photo. So we set up the tripod and then he used the little remote shutter to take this photo. That is it in all of its glory. Love it so much, super wearable. If you need a new pullover, something simple, and beautiful at the same time, elegant, then this is a really great option. And honestly too, I feel like if you are looking for, so if you are a, a man and you would like to get a nice pullover and you like the shape of this, you don't want to change your masculine color, maybe you don't want to pair it with a mohair, I think that this could really be, you know, a unisex design. Honestly, I think that it's, I don't know, suitable for anybody, frankly. Just a really cool wearable design. So I love it. This is the Felix Pullover by Amy Christophers and it is finished. <laughs> So I 
I weave now, you guys. And am I showing you the back side? No, this is the right side. I dove headlong into weaving after watching a video on YouTube. And I can't remember exactly. Oh, no, it is. It's with Wendy. Um, she has a, she's like, I want to say like a million subscribers. She's a huge um, DIYer. She does a lot of DIY sewn clothes on YouTube. And she did a little video on weaving tapestries. And I watched the video. Um, it popped up on my feed because I subscribed to her channel anyway. And I watched it and it was the most soothing, um, just calming video. And then of course she's showing you how she weaves uh, wall tapestries. And it was just very simple, nothing like super technical, just like, kind of walking you through the different steps involved with weaving a you know a wall tapestry and I was immediately hooked on this whole like the ambiance and that calming feeling watching her weave and the way that she set it all up everything about it it was just immediately I wanted a loom and I wanted to weave I don't know I and I see all the beautiful wall hangings on Instagram and Pinterest and so I wanted to be a part of that. And so I'm really, really excited that I've taken it up because it is just as soothing and calming as I thought it would be from watching that video. I'm gonna go ahead and link down to the video in the description box so you can check it out as well if you'd like to go down that weaving rabbit hole. There are lots, actually I'll link to a couple that I've watched. And I think um, the first two are by Wendy um, from With Wendy. And then there's one other I might link to uh, that's not, it's more of a technical um, how to weave. I think it's Creative Bug has uh, a weaving um, tutorial on YouTube and I'll link to that down there as well. But I really, I'm really excited about this because it is everything that it's cracked up to be. Okay, so this is just, um, I'm gonna try my best to kind of hold this up because it is pretty big. So this is just one that I'm doing with some yarns that I picked up at Joann's. Um, and it's kind of a practice of the different techniques. So in weaving, there's different weaving techniques with you know what you do with the the yarn and the way that it moves and the texture that it creates. It has different names. So you know you have your fringe, which is created by what's called a raya knot, and then you have you know your basic weave, which is what's happening here, which is called a tabby weave, and then this right here is called a. Um, a sumac it, it's this essentially this is just a bigger version and then you have your uh, pile which is looping and then this is some more tabby weave over here some um tabby weave right here and then again sumac and i'm just kind of angling it like this it's so i feel like it's great if you want something where spontaneous creativity can be employed without worrying about messing up a pattern or messing up a count or anything. You can kind of just get, just totally be spontaneous if you're not following a particular design. And I think I love that about it because I can grab out something that inspires me and throw it in there. And if I don't like it, it's easy to pull it out. It's just low maintenance, honestly. And what's great too about this, this is a Becca um, loom frame. Um, it was really inexpensive. Well, I mean, it was $69 on Amazon, but you get the frame and you get the shuttle, you get a shed stick, you get a weaving needle, um, all of that. You don't get a uh, beater, which is kind of the comb that you use to beat the yarn down, but I actually, but I, in the beginning, when I started doing this, I say that like I've been doing this for a long time, but when I first started doing it, I just was using a plastic fork to kind of, you know, beat, they call that beating, but you're just pushing the fibers down the warp. These threads here are called the warp threads. And then what you're adding here is called the weft. And if you're familiar with fabrics, um, you understand how that works. So yeah, you can use simple, you know, tools like this that don't cost you anything. And actually there's lots of tutorials on how to make your own loom from just uh, cardboard. Um, or, I mean, if you want to be super simple or by using a vent, like an old uh, thrifted picture frame and some nails. It seems kind of, um, I don't know, laborious and maybe a little unnecessary. I, I, I was totally fine just paying the price to buy a loom, but if you really have zero budget at all and you want to weave, there's ways to do that. And there's a few tutorials. I'll actually link down to those tutorials as well. I believe that um, Felicia Lowe from Sweet Georgia has a tutorial on how to create I, th I think it's how to create a, a DIY loom. She has a lot of great weaving tutorials, but I'll link to that one as well. 
But it's just really easy to get into. You don't really have to have a skill set prior to starting. You just maybe the basic concept of weaving. And that's something that we remember doing in grade school. Um, of course, this is not quite like that, but it's not much different. And I really love it. So I want to share with you guys some of the resources that I found and some of the yarns that I picked up at Joann's that I've been using to work up my wall hanging. Okay, so some things to have to get started um, that you would you would need to get started if you're using a loom frame like that. And these may or may not come with the loom that you purchase, but you need a, um, this right here is called a shuttle stick or just a shuttle. You wrap your yarn around it and you can slip it through the warp threads a lot easier than having to kind of pull your yarn and pull and pull and pull. It kind of keeps it on like a bobbin formation and you can just slip it through the warp threads. I actually have a smaller shuttle that I was using and this is it right here. So all of the yarn is on the shuttle and that way once I start all I have to do is pull out my warp threads and send it through and I don't have to um, you know like I said pull and pull and pull and pull your yarn. When you start doing it you immediately realize how this can come in handy and make things a little bit easier. You'll also get something about the width of a ruler um, or a meter stick and it's not quite as long as a meter stick and it's a little longer than a ruler but this is called the shed stick. Um, what this does is you stick it through over and under over and under through the warp and then when you rotate it it opens up a shed in the warp threads allowing you to take your shuttle and instead of doing the weaving action you just slide it through and then you close your shed down or you, and then you close or rotate your shed stick and it closes the weave back up and you have perfectly woven uh, strand of yarn. So it's really, those are great tools to have. Um, the fork, like I said, a plastic fork is a great beater. If you're not working a really wide tapestry, this works just fine to, you know, beat your yarn down through the warp threads. But I actually picked up um, a comb like this because number one, I like the way it looks, but it's also a little bit wider than the fork. So you can beat down more yarn in one go. and and it also has a hole on it, so if I wanted to hang it somewhere I could, that's kind of an insignificant detail. Um, but it's just a basic comb that I picked up on Amazon when I got my shuttle, my smaller shuttle. Um, this did not come with the loom. The one that came with the loom was the much longer one, which is just much too long for what I'm trying to do. I just added this on, I think it was like $1.99 on Amazon, and that's what I'm gonna be using for my um, beater. And then I also, um, I bought some dowels of various different widths, but I, I have a lot of vintage wooden knitting needles around the house in, in random places, and I thought that those would be kind of a fun thing to use to hang the weaving from. So when you do a wall hanging or a tapestry, it'll be hanging from some kind of a dowel. So I thought it would be kind of a cool way to combine the two crafts to use, you know, a knitting needle and have a tapestry hanging from that. So I have a bunch of those that I've been kind of holding on to that I could use for wall hangings and I thought that would be a cool idea. Let me go ahead and show you some of the yarns that I picked up at Joann's that I'm gonna be using for future wall hangings. Um, and then of course, I'm sure I'll use some things that I accumulate as I go, but I have this giant basket behind me of some really cool yarns that I've been using. Okay, now I wanted to be pretty budget friendly with the yarn that I selected for my first, um, you know, tries at creating tapestries because I just didn't want to break the bank and start using yarns that maybe I'd want to save for a more special tapestry or even just a knitting project or a crochet project. So these are all really budget friendly yarns that you can get at Joanne or Michaels um, or Hobby Lobby, um, something like that. And I love them all. Now, you're gonna have to forgive me because I took labels off of a lot of these things, but all of these things can be found at Joanne. Everything I have here, I specifically purchased at Joanne. You can find them all there. There's a ton of really fun, you know, wall hanging friendly yarns there that are, um, you know, wool, not, uh, wool and uh, not nylon, um, acrylic blends. There's some that have some alpaca in it if you want something that's a little softer, but there's lots of fun stuff. So this is one of them. It's kind of a thick and thin that I picked up. And I want to say this is by Bernat, not 100% sure, but this is a lot of fun for doing, you know, different textures. And when you weave with it, it kind of gives the uh, weave a nice thick and thin bumpy kind of texture. This yarn, it's kind of a mess, is a weird, like, it's flat, um, kind of like flat, like fettuccine like strips of, of yarn. It's an interesting... It's an interesting yarn to be sure, but I knew it would be a really cool texture in a wall hanging. And so I grabbed some of that 
which I like. Of course, Patton's Classic Roving. So this is a 100% wool roving single ply in a chunky weight by Patton's. And then this is what I'm using for the fringe, which is, I believe it's a 100% acrylic, kind of a wispy, wavy, perfect for fringe actually. Nice and soft. It may not be 100% acrylic. It might be one of those ones that has like 10% alpaca in it because they have those at Joanne now. Of course, Thick and Quick, which is a hot mess right now. Um, but Thick and Quick is a really good one for this. And then some more roving in another color that I thought would look nice. And I also have been keeping... Oh, there it is. I purchased this. It is durable, what is it? Durable poly cotton warp thread. So I picked this up on Amazon. This is what you would use to create your warp. Now your warp um, are the threads that go from top to bottom on your loom and that's what you ultimately weave through. And so this was really inexpensive on Amazon. Now I have a lot of it and I can use it. Whenever I wanna start a new weaving, this is what I would use to create my warp. And that's a really good one to have. Um, also, the Paradise Fibers, um, these are roving, like just uh, unspun roving that I picked up on Amazon from Paradise Fibers. I had intended on uh, more pastel colors, but when it was shipped to me, this is what was shipped to me, and I was going to return it, letting them know that it was not the right colors. But I decided against that because I actually do kind of like these, you know, plum being one of my favorite colors. And they're just these little bundles, I haven't opened it yet, of roving that you can use in a weaving. Like, look how pretty that is. And I feel like each one is probably just enough to incorporate, you know, somewhere in a relatively medium-sized weaving. Really nice and soft, 100% merino. So yeah, so that's what these are. I have this many of them. It was $35 for this many, which, you know, it's not cheap, but it's not too bad considering you probably won't use them all in one weaving, or maybe you will, you know, and then you'd have a really beautiful weaving on hand. But I wanted to have some of this that I could work with. So I'm keeping that in my giant weaving basket as well, as I feel inspired to work with it. The blue um, roving that I have on my weaving right now is also Paradise Fibers. I've had this in my stash for a long time. Um, this is actually what I was using when I thought I was going to start drop spindling. Um, it's really pretty, but that's Paradise Fibers as well. And you can get their roving on Amazon, and it's really not very expensive, and it's beautiful colors. So I'm using that there as well. So I wanted to share with you guys some of the books that I picked up to go along with my new weaving uh, craft. You know, when you go down a rabbit hole, it's go big or go home. You have to have the resources. And I have two books here that I picked up on Amazon that I thought would be really good ones to have as resources for weaving. So the first one I have here is um, Little Loom Weaving. Just like really quick things that you can knit on a smaller loom, which is what I have. Mine's a 20 inch by 20 inch loom, um, which is perfect for making these kinds of of wall hangings and tapestries. You can see back here some of the different things that can be done with a smaller loom. This is a circular piece, obviously. You would need something else for that, but things like this, just really cool projects. This is by Andrea Gomez, or Gomes, and yeah, really cute. Lots of fun um, things in here, lots of information on weaving and the techniques and what things are called and, and everything, but it's not too complicated. And that's the thing too about weaving versus like knitting is there's just not a lot that you have to learn. <laughs> Once you know the basic techniques, you can pretty much do anything and uh, come up with your own designs and just have a lot of fun with it. So that's the first book that I got. And then the second one is um, Rachel Denbo DIY Woven Art. And this is an interweave publication. And this has some really beautiful, a little bit more, um, a little higher up on the difficulty level than the previous, but even so, it's not crazy complicated. You just have things that are much more, you know, detailed, like this piece right here, um, you know, things with smaller yarns, really gorgeous stuff. Um, definitely recommend both of these because as, of course, I haven't read through everything, but as I flip through it, if you start getting really super into weaving and wanting to take it up a notch. These are, this one's really great for starting out. Um, so here's the one that I think is really great for starting out. And then this one will take you 
um, even further. So really loving that. Loving weaving just generally. The loom is super portable in the sense that you can move it around the house to wherever you're sitting. You can set it off to the side. I have it sitting out in our living room off to the side in a really cute little like corner um, with my big basket. So whenever I want to work on it, I can just pull it, sit down in front of the TV with my basket and just start working on it. And then when you have to stop, you just stop and you put it away. You don't have to do anything fancy. So I really recommend if you want a new fiber craft to get into, um, give it a shot because it is a very soothing craft, really, really um, enriching and just a cool creative process. So that is my uh, venture into weaving. <laughs> All right, I wanna take some time to do some project forecasting. Now, I don't need any more projects to forecast, um, but I do have uh, some one particular knitting project that I know I'm gonna be casting on pretty soon. I really have been eyeballing the Tenya, Tenya by Caitlin Hunter. The first time I really started to take an interest in the pattern was when I saw Andrea from Fruity Knitting kind of create one for the Edinburgh Yarn Festival, I think last year? I want to say it was last year. She did some modifications to hers. It's a little bit more form fitting. She has long sleeves, but it fits her beautifully. And though I would not knit mine to be quite so form fitting, I just felt like the way she was showing it and the design really kind of came alive when I saw her talking about it and that piqued my interest. And then Kristen from Vol and Vine was also working on one just recently. And I just thought, okay, I need to just cast on because it really is kind of that perfect boxy top um, with, it's not really a, a peplum or a ruffle or anything, but it does have a little bit of a flounce with that lace on the edge. I don't know. I just thought it was a really clever and right down my alley when it comes to style and shape and silhouette design. And so considering that I've only started one Caitlin Hunter, I may as well try another one. So I decided I was going to cast on the Tenya and I am really excited about the yarn that I'm going to use. I've gone back and forth a couple of times with different um, colorways that I wanted to use, types of yarn that I wanted to use. And also too, after knitting up a gauge swatch in kind of a light fingering, and realizing that the gauge, I was gonna have to really go up a needle. And I know everybody's gone up like four needle sizes to get gauge on this particular design. I didn't wanna have to deviate so much. So I decided I was gonna go with a sport weight yarn and see how that works. I have chosen, this is fiber for the people yarn, and you're gonna laugh when you see the color considering the top that I'm wearing. But this is a new colorway that I just brought to the shop called Hot Light. And it's a beautiful goldenrod mustardy, yellow that I'm so excited about. So here's, um, this is it here. So this is called Hot Light. There are some skeins of Hot Light in the shop right now, um, but here it is here on the sport weight. My sport is a 100% non-superwash merino wool, and it's a really beautiful, beautiful yarn. And it's definitely blowing it out here. I feel if I hold it back maybe a little bit more, you can see that it's more of a goldenrod um, color. Let's see if it'll focus on that. Yeah, as soon as I bring it closer to my lights, it kind of blows it out, but it's really beautiful. It's got parts of the color that are more burnt looking, a lot of variegation of yellows. Oh, so pretty. But yeah, this is hot light and this is the sport base, non-super wash. Um, and I'm super excited to, at the prospect of knitting a Tenya in this. Number one for the color, but number two for this yarn. I, I think that it kind of, I mean, you look at it, you kind of think of a DK, but when you give it a little bit of tension, it just looks like it's gonna be the perfect weight for the pattern and I won't have to worry so much about going up or down a needle size drastically. So I'm excited to give this a shot. So this will become the Tenya. Hopefully, if everything goes to plan, then this will become the Tenya. I'm not sure exactly my yardage needs considering this is a sport weight yarn, but we shall see. Super excited. I love this color. I really do um, love this kind of mustardy yellow color. You know, I'm wearing it right now. I feel like it goes pretty well with my complexion. Um, and then for spring or summer, which is when I would probably wear this top, um, despite the fact that it's made of wool, probably more spring early fall, who knows? It's still a really appropriate color. So super excited about that. So the Tenya will be casted on soon and you may see some progress on that on the next episode.
All right, guys, it's almost that time for the show to wrap up. But before I go, I want to take a minute to remind you of the local yarn store call to action. This is where I reach out to you, the viewers, asking you to go out into the wild, into your local yarn stores, your local craft stores, whatever those may be that bring you inspiration. Take some video, send them to me here at the podcast, woolneedleshands at gmail.com. You can find that information down below in the description box. I will patch them together with music and share them here on the podcast and continue to broaden our perspective of this this fiber community that we're a part of. Today's local yarn shop was submitted by Darlie Dullian and it is Black Mountain Yarn Shop in Black Mountain, North Carolina. It is owned by Dawn and Donna and she says that they are the nicest people. She has a, she's part of a knit group there and she's finally gotten around to taking some video and some photos of the shop. So I wanna share that with you guys here. So without further ado, here is Black Mountain Yarn Shop in Black Mountain, North Carolina. <laughs> Thank you so much, Darlie, for your submission. This is absolutely beautiful. Yes, definitely, guys. If you have a great local yarn store that you'd like to share here on the podcast, do it so that I can share it with the rest of the viewers. All right, guys, that's all the time I have for tonight. Thank you so much for sticking it out and hanging out with me through this rather long and full episode of the podcast. I'm excited to continue with my projects and share my next bit of progress with you on the next episode. Until episode 39, I wish you all the best. Happy spring. I hope it's warming up where you are. Happy knitting, happy whatever it is that you're doing. And until next time, bye.